Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. Today is April the 20th, 2020. You know, last night I saw the first episode of The Last Dance, a um, series on Michael Jordan, right, that's playing on ESPN. Now, let me just say, and I know there's a huge... LeBron contingent out there. Uh, for some reason, the LeBron contingent always seems to find me and want to tell me how great LeBron James was. Fair enough. Okay, I'll, you know, I've lived through the LeBron era. LeBron is a great player, no question about it. But LeBron's not MJ. Understand, MJ is both a athlete and a certain level of celebrity, right? Let's talk about his athleticism. Uh, Jordan was a freak athlete. He was fast. He was explosive. Had a very high motor. What doesn't come through in the Last Dance series, at least not the first episode, which is the one I've watched, is that Jordan also was great defensively. I mean, he wins Defensive Player of the Year. An argument can be made, and I know Dennis Rodman was great defensively with the Pistons, but an argument can be made that Jordan should have won more Defensive Players of the Year. Right? He's quick twitch. He's faster, just reflex-wise, than LeBron James. He was also mentally tough, right? Understand, for his career, we're talking about a greater than 80% free throw percentage. He was in Madison Square Garden and he dunked on a guy. Back then, the crowd was a little bit rowdier than it is now. So someone in the crowd yells at him, why don't you dunk on somebody your own size? So the next time down the court, Jordan dunks on a seven-footer looks at the guy in the crowd and says, was that big enough for you? Well, I'll just say, I mean, MJ combative. He was loved. You knew he was combative in a way that today's more media savvy, media friendly athletes aren't, right? We knew he was flawed. We knew he had a big ego. We knew Jordan thought he was better than his opponent. Always. We knew he wanted the last shot. We heard about the gambling. I'm a Knicks fan. I remember the Knicks up on the Bulls in a playoff series, and then some New York reporter runs into Jordan late at night, someplace like Atlantic City or something, writes about it. Jordan comes out and demolishes the Knicks the next four games. We knew he was out late at night. Right? This isn't Tiger where we're surprised by the revelations after the fact. We knew in the moment. Jordan smoked cigars. Jordan liked to gamble. Jordan was one of the likelier guys to be out late at night. We heard about the womanizing. Right? Maybe not as much as you would now, but you kind of assume that Jordan was a man about town. Right? We also saw him in a game attack Reggie Miller. I encourage people to look at that film. That's how high strong Jordan was. Right, you got the feeling that Jordan was the kind of guy who, if you really got under his skin, he would come and he was prepared to fight you. And we knew he wasn't a company guy. Right, Jordan had holdouts. Jordan didn't get along with Chicago Bull management. The Bulls announced that the sixth year, the sixth championship year, that that would be Phil Jackson's last year. And Jordan flatly told the press, I'm not playing for another coach other than Phil Jackson. 
right? Jordan walks away after a championship year. But yet, we loved him. Right? It's, it's hard to explain to people. But here you have a great athlete. Great athlete. Who, you know, had an attitude. Had swagger. As you look at the HBO series, you're going to notice that the 80s and 90s were a different time than now. When Jordan walks, there's a little bit of a giddy-up in his step. Right? He has a little bit of a swag about him. Right? As I've told many people, right, the young guys who keep coming up to me at a bar I go to, right, as I've told them many times, Kobe was more like Jordan, just style-wise, than LeBron James was. Right? LeBron James is a guy who dribbles down and is looking for the best play for his team. That's who LeBron is, right? Jordan and Kobe were looking for the best shot for themselves. Now, if guys came over to prevent them from taking the shot, then those guys were both above average passers. They could pass to a teammate, but make no mistake, the teammate was always plan B, right? Jordan wanted to take the shot himself. You understood that. Let me also say, too, that maybe it's a sign of the times. You knew that with Larry Bird as well. Right? Games on the line. Larry Bird wanted to take the shot. Don't get me wrong. If they double teamed Larry or if Larry was, you know, out of position, then he would pass to somebody else. But that was the mindset. Right? Jordan carried his team. And the people around him loved him for it. Different era than now, right? So, that got me thinking, and my girl knows this video is going to get me in trouble. Who are the guys since I've been watching boxing, right? In the 70s and up. Who are the guys since I've been watching boxing who've had runs, like Michael Jordan, right? Not knights, not an individual knight. I'll say the Anthony Joshua Vladimir Klitschko fight was one of the best boxing events I've seen in my life. That was electric. You felt the electricity. Then the fact that Joshua closes that fight by stoppage. And the fact that Joshua at that time was unbeaten really gave him a glow. But understand, that's very different than a Michael Jordan type of run, where in Jordan's case, it lasts more than a decade, right? In boxing, let's just say you have to be at a place where there are a series of fights, where people look at you and you're bending perception. Right? With Jordan, you looked at him and you thought, my God, as Jerry West, the Hall of Famer, put it, Hall of Fame GM, right? The guy who, you know, gets Shaquille O'Neal, uh, trades for Kobe. As Jerry West put it, someone in the talent evaluation business, he said, Michael Jordan is a Babe Ruth figure. And that's the best analogy I can come across, because Babe Ruth is a guy who famously you know, got caught stealing to end a World Series with Lou Gehrig at the plate. People, people felt Babe was a womanizer. People felt that Babe Ruth didn't really take the sport as seriously as he should have. But yet, he's the first guy in baseball history to hit 30 home runs, 40 home runs, 50 home runs, and 60 home runs. And we know when Babe Ruth got to the dugout, after his 60th home run, Babe Ruth looked at his teammates and said, let's see some son of a bitch try to beat that. Right? That's the Jordan mindset. It's not one night. Like Babe Ruth, it's a run of years. Right? It's when you look at the guy and you say, my God, is this guy the best I've seen at this? Right? There has to be a bit of an illusion involved. 
where you look at Jordan and you forget that Wilt scored 100 in a game. Wilt goes through a season averaging 50. Right? You overlook all the guys. You overlook the fact that Oscar goes a year averaging a triple-double. This is before Jordan. Right? That like Jordan, Oscar was a guy his first year out the gate who averaged more than 25, more than five boards, and more than five assists a game as a rookie. Right? Nonetheless, you look at Jordan and you thought, my, my God, is this guy the best I've seen at this? And, of course, the talent, the skill, that's just part of it. The other part is, when the guy is out in public, is he loved by the public? The guy doesn't have to be a saint. The guy doesn't have to be a role model. The guy just has to be loved. Where men and women look at the guy and think, my God, this guy is special. This guy is historic. So, here's where I get into trouble on this video. Some of the best fighters I've seen in my life, to me, can't be compared to Michael Jordan. Because while we respected them, while they were tremendous fighters, they didn't have the popularity. It's kind of like Russell Westbrook right now, right? Who Jordan, by the way, loves. Westbrook has had statistically some of the best years in NBA history, right? He's a guy who has averaged a triple-double for multiple years. But yet, you know, you're asking yourself, wow, should I put Russell Westbrook on the All-Star team? You know, would KD have done better early in his career if he had some teammate other than Russell Westbrook? Wouldn't James Harden have done better if he had some teammate other than Russell Westbrook? Does Westbrook get the wins that a Jordan, a LeBron, a Kobe would get? So, let me name some fighters who don't make my list. Then I'll name the five who do. Right? These are all guys who were devastating while I followed boxing. These are some of the best fighters in history, at least to me. But, as talented as these guys were, they weren't popular enough. They weren't the man about town that epitomized their era enough to make this list. Roy Jones, great fighter might have gone through the best run I've seen a fighter go through in the ring. Roy Jones was not loved by the public. Floyd Mayweather, great fighter, excellent defensively, right? Mayweather was not loved. He's respected. He's not loved, right? Salvador Sanchez, you know, I know he died young. My goodness, this was a great fighter. But Sanchez, a fighter's fighter, uh, the guy who Roy Jones claims got him into boxing. Right? Think about that. You know, Sanchez was so good, he inspired other greats to get into the sport. But Sanchez really wasn't known enough. The Hawk, Aaron Pryor, right? Not known enough also has the same problem, quite frankly, that people like Barry Bonds have in baseball. Right? That Panama Lewis sequence in the first Alexis Arguello fight, where Lewis says, not that one, the one I mixed, right? Gives Aaron Pryor, supposedly, a bottle of water, right? Lewis later would claim it had Perrier in it or something like that, right? It was still water, but it was carbonated water. Looks fishy to me, right? I think they're, and it's sad because it hurts his legacy, just like it hurts Barry Bonds' legacy, right? Bonds' home run total isn't viewed quite the same way as Hank Aaron's. Aaron Pryor, a guy who beat Thomas the Hitman Hearns as an amateur, if I'm correct, 
because of the Panama Lewis situation. And even though he beats Alexis Arguello in the rematch, great fighter, but there are question marks. Julio Cesar Chavez. Now I'll say this, Chavez was loved in the Mexican community. No question about it. He wasn't MJ here in America. Right? He was loved, but not an MJ-level guy. Pernell Whitaker, perhaps the best defensive fighter I've seen in my life. I saw a classic fight the other day. Pernell Whitaker against Roger Mayweather. I had forgotten that Pernell actually drops Roger Mayweather at a point in that fight. Pernell could actually get offensive when he needed to. He wasn't loved. He was barely known outside of boxing. Lennox Lewis. You know, I feel Lennox Lewis is one of the best heavyweights I've seen. Right? There was a time period there where Lennox Lewis, who I believe becomes undisputed heavyweight champion, but there was a time period where the belts didn't matter. You knew who the best heavyweight was. Right? He beats David Tua. He beats an unbeaten Michael Grant. That was a huge fight before the fight. Right? But Lennox Lewis wasn't loved. He couldn't make a sneaker line that was going to generate, you know, nine figures. Right? That just wasn't Lennox Lewis. Lewis was a fighter's fighter. Just didn't have the popularity outside the fight ring. Now, I agree. He had some huge financial fights, just like Floyd did. Right? His fight against Mike Tyson, big financially. He got paid top dollar when he fought Evander Holyfield. Right? I'm not saying these guys aren't box office in boxing. But they just weren't loved outside of boxing to be in the MJ conversation. Anthony Joshua, I've mentioned him already. I'll agree, he's the box office king right now in boxing. He has a hold on the UK. What people need to understand is he's still in witness protection here in the United States. Right? When he beat Vladimir Klitschko, understand that Klitschko hadn't fought for a year and Klitschko didn't have the title. That's not the Vladimir Klitschko that Tyson Fury beat, who had the title. Right? Finally, Tyson Fury. Look, I think Tyson Fury is a special heavyweight. But his story is still being written. Right? He's just starting to get recognized here in the United States. He hasn't had the signature moments that the guys I'm going to mention have had. So here are the five guys who I believe had runs that, to me, are the boxing equivalent of being Michael Jordan. In other words, these guys reached a point where they're really beyond Hall of Famers, where they're iconic, where you're looking at the guy and you're saying, my goodness, you know, is this guy the best guy to ever do this? Now, I'm telling you, that view is an illusion, right? Life always has players. I wonder how Oscar Robertson would do in today's NBA, for example. Right? But in the moment, these fighters were so good that you thought to yourself, my goodness. And of course, outside the ring, these guys were loved. Right? You just got the feeling that if the guy was in a restaurant in town, a crowd would form outside the restaurant. Now, if we go back to the 1970s, I'll just say this. A very good argument to me can be made that the top three heavyweight fights of the 1970s all involve the same guy. Now, understand, he's an icon going into the 70s, right? This is a guy who spoke at Harvard, right? This is a guy who... You know, was unbeaten, got stripped of his heavyweight title. Was unbeaten, refused to serve in Vietnam. America had an anti-war movement. This guy was showing up at protests. 
right? This guy was challenging the ability of government to take away his right to work, to order him to serve in the army at a time when the United States had a military draft. Very divisive guy. He's the guy who gets booed by the crowd as he enters the ring as heavyweight champ for the Sonny Liston rematch. Right, now Muhammad Ali, unbeaten. Right, Olympic champion. Fights Joe Fraser, unbeaten. Olympic champion. For the heavyweight title. In a fight that was so big that legend has it that Frank Sinatra could not get tickets. So when Life Magazine found out about it, they offered Frank the opportunity to be their photographer at the fight. I'm not kidding. And so Frank is close to the ring holding a camera right, with a press credential. I believe this is the only fight that Frank Sinatra served as a boxing photographer at, right? Frank was a big boxing fan. His boy was Joe Lewis back in the day. Well, anyway, understand Ali Fraser was really the fight of the century at that point. You've had other unbeaten champions having unification matches, but not like this, right? Where both were Olympic gold medalists. Understand, too, stylistically, and I know this is unfair to Joe Fraser, but Ali represented the anti-war movement. Joe Fraser represented the people who were doing things the so-called right way. Right? There was a cultural divide in America at the time. The two guys meet in the ring in what would be a huge fight. So then we go forward a few years. There's another Olympic gold medalist, George Foreman who's just destroyed Kenny Norton, right? According to legend, Don King, I don't know if this is true or not, but it's the rumor, Don King got both Ali and Foreman to sign blank pieces of paper, filled in the rest. I believe they got $5 million each or something like that. Foreman then, excuse me, Don King then arranges for Zaire to do the fight. The fight's called the Rumble in the Jungle. I'm telling you, at the time, we thought there was simply no way that Ali could win that fight. I'm telling you, at the time, people understood that Ali was no longer the Ali of the 1960s. He didn't have the reflexes, etc. Right? Couldn't stay on his toes for 12 rounds. And I remember there was conversation on whether this fight should be allowed to happen. Right? We thought Ali could get badly hurt. In a stunning upset, Ali gives Foreman his first loss, becomes the champ. Then you have the third huge heavyweight fight of the 70s. Let's face it, an argument can be made that these are the best fights of the 70s. The third fight tops them all. It's the thriller in Manila. Ali, Fraser, go at it. Forget the event. The fight itself is one of the best fights in heavyweight history, right? Ali was the kind of guy who, if he were crossing the street, he'd draw a crowd. Several people wanted to hear him talk, not just about boxing. Howard Cosell would ask him about the world. And understand, Ali was a Teflon Don. Right? Like MJ, he could do ridiculous things that were highly offensive. Calling Joe Fraser a gorilla? Saying he's going to beat the gorilla in Manila? Come on, that's playing on the worst stereotypes. And yet, at the time, we laughed with him. Right? Ali could do really nothing wrong. He had a hardcore committed fan base. Hardcore. Right? The Leon Spinks fights shouldn't even have happened. Leon Spinks had had seven pro fights or something like that when he fought Ali. There's several questionable decisions in the Ali run. Right? I thought he lost to Jimmy Young. I'll, I'll be blunt here. 
right? I thought they called the Ron Lyle fight too early. I thought they called the uh, Ernie Shavers fight uh, wrong. But look, there's no denying his popularity. It was singular. Right? You looked at Ali and you understood, my goodness, this guy's the most popular man in the sport. He was one of the most popular man, men in history. I was watching the beginning of the uh, 96 Olympics. And I was wondering, wow, who are they going to have to light the Olympic torch? And there was Ali. His hands were moving and stuff like that. And before he lights the torch, I was cheering. Right? The guy had that level of aura. Well, after the thrill in Manila, we get to the 1976 Olympics. And there's a young guy who apparently had had a kid early in life. And he had a picture of a kid inside of his socks. He was a little bit awkward. We would learn later that he had been molested as a child. Right? He was unsure of himself. He would openly say in interviews that he didn't want to have a long pro career. That he was just in this short term to pay for his family. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's how I became aware of Sugar Ray Leonard. Right in the ring, my goodness, no one looked better. Blinding hand speed. A puncher's mentality. Women loved him. Right? I have a test on just how popular a guy is with women. Right? When I was younger, if my mother knew of the fighter, right? if my mother knew of the fighter, then I knew, wow, this guy must, must be popular with women. Right? So I knew without a question that Muhammad Ali was popular with women. Right? I knew without question that Ray Leonard was popular with women. Now, I'll just say this. If you want to see Ray Leonard at his best, I want you to look at the Davy Boy Green fight. That's the fight he has right before he hops in the ring with Roberto Duran the first time. Devastating fight. Right? Ray was a guy who I know as an amateur, he said he didn't want a long career. He was a guy who looked like he enjoyed opening up on a guy. Right? Blinding hand speed, more importantly, unlike many defensive fighters today, unlike Purnell, right? Ray committed to his punches. Right? He loses to Duran the first fight. Gets roughed up, in my opinion. Then we get the no moss fight. Now understand, the world was different back then. You would hear about the fight, then weeks would pass. Then you would see it on, you know, uh, ABC, White World of Sports, or whatever it was. So, the no moss fight. I didn't see that fight live. I started hearing about bolo punches and stuff like that. I thought, what's that about? Kid chocolate or what? Ray Leonard's doing bolo punches, he's moving around, uh, and apparently he gets Duran to say no moss. Right? But then Ray hits a much higher level. It's one of the best fights in history. I would encourage people to look at Ray Leonard against Thomas the Hitman Hearns. Folks, that's a great fight. Ray gets tested in that fight. Right? Ray has a swollen eye in that fight. That's the beginning of the end for Ray's initial run. Right? That is a great fight. That's the fight where Ray's corner man, who was Ali's corner man, Angelo Dundee, gets frustrated with his fighter and says, you're blowing it, kid. You're blowing it, kid. Right? That's the fight where Ray, to fool Hearns, Start shaking his right hand, framing it. Oh, man. Great fighter. More importantly, like MJ, right? Ray Leonard could not cross the street without drawing a crowd. There's a difference between Ray Leonard and Floyd Mayweather. You went to Mayweather fights to root against Mayweather. You went to Ray Leonard fights 
to root for Ray, right? Ray bent perception so much that he's out of the ring for three years. I'm not kidding. Three years. Even holds a press conference that Marvin Hagler attends where he says, I'm not coming back because Ray had a detached retina that was surgically repaired, which was big in the 1980s. And, of course, he's out of the ring for three years and people still thought that he had a chance against one of the 80s most dominant fighters, Marvelous Marvin Hagler. Right? It's shocking. And, of course, Ray was awarded the win. I'll leave it up to armchair boxing judges on whether Ray actually won that Hagler fight. I'll say this. It's an accomplishment that Ray went the distance against Marvin Hagler. Right? The next fighter, I know I'm going to get blowback on him, but I was alive during the era and I remember it vividly. Right? This guy's a lot like MJ. Right? MJ was controversial. People forget it. He was so controversial in the sport that he shows up to an all-star game and the other all-stars freeze him out including all-stars on his team, right? They don't want him having the ball. They're roughing him up a bit, right? People forget, too, that MJ was so controversial that after he got history's first triple-double in an all-star game, right? Since then, LeBron has done it. I know that. But MJ is the first. And his team won the all-star game. So, of course, they gave the MVP of that game to his teammate. Right? People forget the tension at times between MJ and other players, as well as MJ and the powers that be. Right? Um, also, you know, Karl Malone was awarded the uh, MVP of the league twice. An argument can be made that People had MJ fatigue. Well, here's what I know about Oscar De La Hoya. Right? During the era, like MJ, Oscar seemed to be a victim of politics at times. Right? No question about it. There was a feeling that Oscar, who was raised in East L.A., was not a real Latino. <laughs> it's, it's, it's laughable for me to think about this now, but at the time, right, whether it was the Hernando Hernandez fight, and Hernandez, in his ring walk, look it up, enters the ring to, this is how we do it, and the crowd's going crazy, and you could tell the crowd has a lot of people behind him. Whether it was the Julio Cesar Chavez fight, or whether it was the Fernando Vargas fight, where Julio Cesar Chavez leads Vargas into the ring. There was a feeling by some that Oscar wasn't, you know, the true Latino in the fight. That somehow Oscar, you know, didn't deserve loyalty from the community. Right? This is a guy who, you know, wins the Olympic gold medal. This is a guy who didn't come from money. Right? Well, let me just say this. Before Oscar, weigh-ins were a boring affair. Right? You'd see a guy on the scale. They would say, he weighs 146. Then you see the other guy on the scale. And that was pretty much it. What happened was that women started showing up for Oscar De La Hoya's weigh-ins, right? There are Oscar De La Hoya weigh-ins where women are throwing underwear at him. That's when the light went on for promoters, and they said, you know what, we should have this weigh-in in a bigger venue. So then they started having the weigh-in in a bigger venue. And, of course, thousands of people started showing up. You can thank Oscar De La Hoya for that. 
It's De La Hoya who people knew there was some tension there, right? There were rumors, as there was with MJ, as there was with Ali, as there was with Ray Leonard. There were rumors that Oscar was a womanizer. Right? You know, I'll just say this. Not only did Oscar fight the tough fights, right? I thought he lost the Pernell Whitaker fight. The bottom line, though, is he took the Pernell Whitaker fight. Right? I Corte. I thought that was a close fight. Oscar delivered late in that fight. I know the scorecards are a little off. Oscar delivered in that fight. Right? Like MJ getting overlooked, you know, for the all-star MVP with the triple-double. You know, I wonder as I look back, did Oscar really lose to Felix Trinidad? I think that fight requires re-examination. Right? We now know that Shane Mosley may have had PEDs in his system, or at least stamina enhancers, EPO, for the rematch. And even with that in his system, on my scorecard, he lost to Oscar. Right? The judges jobbed Oscar on that one. I believe, as with MJ, we had Oscar De La Hoya fatigue. But Oscar was a great fighter. The Chavez fight's not close. Chavez is all bloody. Right? Chavez is beaten badly. I thought Oscar puts together a run and has the popularity outside the ring to qualify for this list. Let's face it, too. You know how good a guy is by the number of guys who were juicing against him. Fernando Vargas failed a post-fight drug test for his fight against Oscar De La Hoya. Right? Guys sounded tough in front of the camera and then behind the camera thought they needed a supplement to be competitive. Now, I know. The Floyd Mayweather crowd is going to say, hey, look, you know, we beat Oscar. Why aren't we on the list? I'll just put it this way. I was in the MGM sports book, not at the fight. I was just in Vegas for a weekend of partying for the Floyd Mayweather Oscar De La Hoya fight. I can tell you that people poured in from the Garden Arena. The fight was at the MGM Garden Arena. They poured into the sports book after that fight. Many people thought Oscar's fans were all over the sports book. Many people thought Oscar got robbed in that fight. Right now, I've seen the fight now. You know, I've, I watched the replays. I thought Floyd won the fight. Right? You know how I break down fights? I thought Floyd realized that Oscar was a one-handed fighter, exploited that. I thought Floyd ruled the day. But understand, right? Oscar was the one with the fans. Oscar was the one with the people who loved him. Right? I'm sure Oscar's fans, you can comment on any of these fighters in the comment section of these videos, but Oscar was the person who a lot of people wanted to win. Right? I'm telling you, the mood was so tense in the sports book that me and my buddy left. I thought a riot was going to break out. Right? Let me also say, too, that Oscar left no doubt later against Fernando Vargas. Quite frankly, if De La Hoya didn't like to hit buffets, right, I can say the same thing about Ali, right? Both guys seem to have to lose weight to make weight. If Oscar De La Hoya treated his body a little bit better, I thought he would have beaten Bernard Hopkins. I thought De La Hoya looked good early in that fight. But you could tell that De La Hoya, like Ricky Hatton, was a guy who didn't really keep himself in great shape between fights, right? This is late in his career, and it cost him. He should have had more years left, but he makes this list, right? There is a time there where Oscar, to me, is the most popular fighter in boxing, and he was the man in the ring. Let me name two more guys for this list. 
coming out of the Larry Holmes era, every elite heavyweight seemed to be 6'2 and taller. Every elite heavyweight seemed to have a great jab. Everyone came into the ring wearing a luxurious robe with very colorful, personalized, perhaps ad-supported trunks. Everyone seemed to have an entourage, right? You'd have it look like 10 guys entering the ring together. And then along comes Mike Tyson. Short, explosive. Whereas other guys were trying to win rounds, Mike Tyson seemed to be going for the KO from the first punch. Black trunks, wore a towel with a hole cut out for the head into the ring. Kevin Rooney was his trainer and both he and Mike Tyson would be expressionless. Both guys seemed to be in a hurry. You know, just understand that Tyson was stylistically jarring. More importantly, Mike Tyson was the truth in the ring. He goes on a run. I'm just going to name the guys who he stops. Right? Who he stops. I, I'm not even naming the guys he beat by decision. Right? And they include a previously unbeaten Tony Tucker, for example. Uh, James Bonecrusher Smith, for example. No, just the guys he knocked out during a stretch of time in the 80s. Marvis Fraser. Trevor Burbeck, Pinklin Thomas, right? Some of these guys are former champions. Terrell Biggs, former Olympian. Larry Holmes, Tony Tubbs, Michael Spinks, Frank Bruno, right? Carl The Truth Williams, who I thought beat Larry Holmes but didn't get the decision. Right, Tyson goes on a run. Tyson was a complete break from the past. Right, you looked at Tyson during this run and you thought, I mean, you ask yourself a question that you ask with very few. Right, it was, is there anyone who's ever been better than this guy? Who would win a fight between Prime Tyson and Prime Ali? Right? Those were the names. Right? I thought Tyson, Joe Lewis, Joe's too slow for Mike. Now, I'll agree. Now that I'm older, Lewis is a short puncher, hit incredibly hard. Uh, that would be an interesting fight. But let's just say Mike Tyson, skill-wise was elite. He got results. He was running through guys who previously were very tough. Very tough to beat. Right? He just seemed to walk through them. More importantly, the public was in love with Mike Tyson. Before he fights Michael Spinks, he, made, he signed a big deal with Pepsi. Everyone knew his girlfriend at the time was Robin Givens. Right? And there's Mike Tyson, and, you know, Tyson was saying he had nothing to worry about in the ad and stuff like that. And folks loved him. The guy connected with the public. I was a summer associate at a law firm in, like, 1988. And I was uh, conducting a little office-wide pool on who would win Tyson, Michael Spinks. Both guys were unbeaten at the time. Right, Spinks was an Olympic gold medalist. Spinks had beaten Larry Holmes twice. Spinks beat Jerry Cooney, KO'd him. So, I was talking with a secretary, and she said, I want the first round. I want Tyson in the first round. And I said, come on now. I said, come on now. Michael Spinks has never lost. I said, Tyson's just one of the champions in this fight. This is top-level boxing. Tyson's fighting a real opponent. And she looked at me and she said, I want Tyson in the first round. She's the one who won the pool. 
right? Tyson was closing the show and he was doing it in astonishing fashion. Tyson also was lifting his game. Young Tyson is emptying the gun. As Tyson fought a few times, he started to notice that Tyson would have a hurt opponent in front of him. And Tyson would just stand there and pick his next shot. Devastating. He's on this list. He, he, he epitomized boxing in the late 1980s, right? It was Tyson who started showing up on rap songs, right? During the Holmes era, nobody said, yeah, I'm like Larry Holmes, right? Suddenly, you have Mike Tyson and guys started talking about Mike Tyson, right? The ring entrance, the whole style, folks, it was a paradigm shift. Let me also name the last fighter on this list. And this list will be noteworthy because two of the guys I will have named will have lost to a guy who's not on the list. Floyd Mayweather. Let me just say, now I had seen Fast Hands before. Right? I'd seen Ray Leonard. I had seen Hector Camacho, who belongs on any list of fast hands, right? Camacho could have been on this list, but he self-destructed, right? Well, I'll say this. I'd seen fast hands before, but not like this. And this guy was a southpaw, and he was KOing almost everyone. Manny Pacquiao first hit the public light. I know he beats Le Boisbois years earlier, but it's when he blows out Marco Antonio Barrera, excellent fighter, that people started to notice him. He then drops Marquez several times before settling for a draw. Gets decisioned by a great fighter, El Terrible, Eric Morales, but leaves no doubt, none whatsoever, in the rematch. Right? He then gains weight, blows out lightweight champion David Diaz. So by the time he fights Oscar De La Hoya, you thought he was a great fighter. The De La Hoya fight simply put, and I got it wrong here online, that was one of my early fights. Manny Pacquiao's performance against Oscar De La Hoya to me is a masterpiece. It's one of the best fights I have ever seen a fighter have. Legendary. Let me just say too, that fight has some compelling moments. Right? Pacquiao at the time had a trainer, Freddie Roach, and you could tell the guys are close. Pacquiao was a huge underdog going into the fight. Right? I know Oscar had to you know, weigh in after the official weigh in and was on a severe weight restriction that didn't allow him to gain weight and stuff like that. Still, I was watching that fight. And I remember Freddie Roach talking to Pacquiao and somewhere along the fight, <laughs> somewhere in the fight, it dawned on me that Roach and Pacquiao firmly believed that Pacquiao was going to win the fight by stoppage. Right, the huge underdog. Roach at one point says to him something like, take him out. <laughs> and you're watching the fight, and I thought the little man was going to be trying to hide. Understand, Oscar's left hand was lethal. And here was the little man assuming that he was the better man. Well, after that legendary night, Pacquiao goes on a run. Right, He was the most popular guy in the sport at the time, in my opinion. He beats Ricky Hatton, who was tough at the time. Then he beats Miguel Cotto. Then he beats Joshua Clotty. Then he beats Antonio Margarito. Then he beats Shane Mosley. 
folks, that's in succession. Right? At that point, and I know there were rumors about Pacquiao, right? Because like Jordan, <laughs> like everyone on this list, Pacquiao was rumored to be a womanizer. Pacquiao was a guy who traveled with an entourage. Right? There, there were a lot of similarities, quite frankly, between Pacquiao and Sugar Ray Robinson. Right? Pacquiao traveled with an entourage. Pacquiao seemed to be insulated from the world. Right? Pacquiao gave some terrible interviews during that period of time where you wonder where Pacquiao stood on some social uh, issues. Right? There's even the Alex Ariza angle. And I know it drops Pacquiao a little bit. The idea of Ariza giving Pacquiao shakes that, to date, no one knows what Pacquiao had in them. Right? We were a little bit suspicious of Pacquiao. Because the guy somehow was gaining weight but maintaining power. Right? He was able to hurt guys with chins. And he wouldn't weigh the weight limit. Right? A Pacquiao welterweight weigh-in would be the other guy weighing 147 and Manny Pacquiao weighing 144 or something like that. <laughs> then Pacquiao would go in the ring and he would hurt the other guy badly. No, I'm not... You know, I don't know what rim the shakes Pacquiao received. I understand history is going to discount. Let's just be blunt. Some of his accomplishments, just like it's discounted, the accomplishments of Barry Bonds. No question about it, in my opinion. Right? Some historian someplace 50 years from now is going to say, hey, I wonder what was going on here. Right? The Pacquiao-Floyd fight was passed its expiration date because even though Floyd was willing to fight Manny Pacquiao, Pacquiao didn't want the drug testing protocol. Let me just say, there was a group in boxing back then that had the mindset of, who cares what drugs the guy is on? Right? The champion is the guy who can beat him at the weight class. I remember Marvin Hagler, one of my favorite fighters in history, but never popular enough to hit this list. Marvin Hagler said, come on, man, drop the drug testing requirement. And I don't think Hagler was a juicer. I think he's from the side of the street that says, look, the other guy can take whatever he wants. If you're the champ, you beat him in whatever condition he shows up in. Right? But we have drug testing for a reason. People's lives are on the line. I'll agree. There is a stretch of Pacquiao's career where, you know, questions will be raised about his preparation. Pacquiao famously said that he didn't want to submit to drug testing because he was afraid of needles. And he talked about how he had blood drawn right before his fight against Eric Morales, which he lost, right? Now that opens the door where people are saying, oh, you were drug tested for that fight and you lost that fight. But I will say this. Like Ali, right, who showed up to a press conference with a woman who people thought was his wife, who wasn't his wife, Right, later became his wife. Of course, Ali was married at the time to someone else. Um, like Jordan, who we knew was a gambler, who we knew stayed out late at night. Right? I'll just say this. There's a moment there where Manny Pacquiao is completely bulletproof where people thought that Pacquiao was not only the best fighter pound for pound in the sport, but that Pacquiao was a guy who they wanted to have a drink with. They wanted to pay to see, right? Pacquiao was the best fighter and the most popular fighter for many, for a stretch of years. Right now, it's hard to believe he fought Oscar De La Hoya in 2008, and he's still <laughs> among the elites 
at 147. I tip my hat to Manny. Manny makes the list. Right? Freddie Roach in an interview once said, hey, he didn't know what was in the shakes that Alex Ariza was giving Manny Pacquiao. Right? Apparently, if you believe the folklore, Pacquiao hired Ariza, not Freddie Roach. Right? Roach had to go with whatever nutritional consultants the fighters chose. Right? I don't know what was in the shakes. What I do know is that Pacquiao walked away from what would have been the most lucrative fight in the sport over the drug testing issue. I know this is kind of like criticizing Anthony Joshua. I know there's a group out there that's going to say, Dwyer, you're not right. Right? That's not right. Floyd's the one who ducked Manny Pacquiao. Okay, look, whatever. Right? I lived through the era. In my opinion, Floyd was prepared to fight Manny when both were riding high, when Pacquiao and Floyd were both closer to their prime. Understand, Mayweather himself won titles in several weight classes. Mayweather was prepared to fight Pacquiao during Pacquiao's legendary run. The fight did not happen. Mayweather was prepared to submit to drug testing. Manny Pacquiao at that time was not. Let me add an addendum. The addendum needs to be added. Right? Mayweather would later himself hire Alex Ariza. Right now, again, I have no evidence or proof that Alex Ariza gave any fighter at any time anything improper. But I will say that, you know, it is the kind of thing that boxing historians will consider. That's my list. That's how I see it in the comment section of this video. What I want the Boxing Hardcore here to do, and I know this video is long by my standards, right? What I want you to do is if I left somebody off the list, and to the older fight fans, because I'm unqualified to talk about the 60s and earlier, if there's somebody else out there who you feel belongs on this list, and I understand Sugar Ray Robinson was the man. I understand. It's just that that's a little before my time. I really can't comment on it, right? If there are other fighters who you feel belong on this list, then I hope you leave their names in the comment section of this video. I'll agree that Canelo is well on his way to being as iconic as they come, right? But, for some reason, I just don't think he's quite there yet, right? Comment on that. Comment on whatever you like in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.